Welcome to Nothing Ventured with me, Arish Shah. This is the podcast where we explore the people and stories that make up the tech and venture ecosystem. Don't forget to subscribe, like, rate, and share the podcast because it really helps us get the word out to more people who are curious about understanding even more about the world of venture capital. This season of Nothing Ventured is sponsored by Odin. Odin helps angels, VCs, and founders to raise and deploy capital seamlessly. You can structure your SPVs and now run your funds, handle capital calls, portfolio management more smoothly and easily in one place. Founders use Odin to raise their entire round in a few clicks by simply sending investors a link and receiving investments immediately. Odin works with over 5,000 investors and over 150 emerging fund managers and angel syndicates globally. Head to joinodin.com to learn more. That's J-O-I-N-O-D-I-N.com. Hello and welcome to another episode of Nothing Ventured with me, Arish Shah. Today, I was super excited to have with me in the studio, Nada Sabogian. Nada is a GP at 360 Capital, a venture capital firm investing in early stage, innovative, deep tech and digital enterprises across Europe and based out of Paris and Milan. Nada spent 15 years as an operator and led Bravo Solution, ultimately a procurement and su supply management solutions provider, to $100 million in SaaS revenue before SAS was even a thing. He is also adjunct professor at Università Bocconi, where he teaches an undergraduate program course in management of technology, innovation, and operations. In today's episode, we talked about how mad you have to be to leave McKinsey to join a startup in the early 2000s, how commerce moved from consumer to B2B, and inventing SAS as a survival strategy, why as a VC, it is better to hunt in your own backyard, and why this is the right time to start a business and the right time to invest, because there is a lot less nonsense out there. Let's get straight into it. Nada, it's great to have you in the studio uh, with me today. Thank you so much and, and really uh, excited. This is the first pod of uh, 2024, which uh, is already shaping up to be an incredible year. Um, in a bit of a change from the norm, we're going to go through kind of what we would have traditionally done as a primer episode as a bit of a quick fire. So um, for our audience to get to know you a bit better, what was your first job? Uh, I was selling tablecloths on the streets of Florence to tourists. Amazing. And yeah, as, as a teenager. <laughs> and, okay, I'm, I'm assuming not, not today. Uh, and what did you do before you got into the tech and venture ecosystem? Uh, I was on the other side. I was actually, you know, uh, founder and operator of tech startups uh, for about 15 years Amazing. Uh, before I got into yeah. venture. Okay. Yeah. And what triggered your move into joining 360 Capital? Uh, to be honest, it was opportunistic. I, I just exited my company. I... I got involved more intensely in doing uh, business angel activities. I kind of liked the whole profession of investing and working with founders. And uh, I knew the 360 Capital team. There was good level of trust. They were looking for someone like me to complement the team. And so all stars were lined up for me to join. And I joined in 2016. Amazing. And what would you be doing if you hadn't have got into venture, do you think? To be honest, I, I wasn't really ready to get back into running companies. I, I kind of enjoyed getting into the investment activities. I've probably done more of, you know, VC on my own mm -hmm. as, as an amateur investor uh, with my own money and uh, and done more teaching. I'm, I've, I've also been teaching at university. Uh, so so yeah. uh, I would have probably got more into to, 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 to teaching activities. Amazing. Yeah. And so let's talk about 360. So what is the AUM? Uh, half a billion. Uh, we've been around since 97, so the firm is very well established in, in France and Italy. Uh, those are also the two geographies on which we focus on. Mm -hmm. uh, we we invest fairly broadly. Uh, the focus is on Europe, but as I said, predominantly France and Italy. And uh, you can so you can classify our investment activities into sort of broad-based digital initiatives, uh, deep tech. We do quite a bit of deep tech. Uh, and also most recently, the last four or five years, we've got involved in uh, investing in climate tech and anything that has to do with uh, innovation and sustainability. Amazing. And what stage is in check size? Uh, stage is early stage. So we're looking at uh, seed in Series A, so yeah. from half a million to five million euros entry. Amazing. And uh, if you think about three companies from inside or outside the portfolio that you're excited about? Uh, well, uh, We've got, uh, I'll, I'll name you three from three different countries. Amazing. Um, uh, I would say uh, 
uh, Prophecy is, is a company that we have in France. Uh, they're, they're coming up with a very innovative uh, neuromorphic uh, sensor. Sort of they're working on building the image sensor for the world of AI. Uh, it's, it's a French-based company. Uh, Energy Dome is an Italian company, and they've, uh, they, they're focusing on building a long-term uh, battery storage. So this mm -hmm. is, a, is a key challenge for the, the, the energy transition yep. phase. Uh, both these companies have raised substantial amounts of money, you know, close to 100 million. Uh, and the third company is a Spanish company we most recently invested in. It's about three years ago we invested in. It's done phenomenally well. It's called Iris Risk, and it's uh, and it's in the cybersecurity space. A company that does uh, uh, over half of its revenue in the United States is based in this little town north of Spain, and uh, they've done phenomenally well. They've they've gone from you know. Uh, uh, just over a million euros in ARR when we invested to uh, close to 13 million euros in ARR this year. So in phenomenal, incredible. in three years. Incredible, yeah. incredible. Oh, yeah. And one final question, breakfast, lunch, or dinner? I like dinner. Excellent, <laughs> excellent. Uh, yeah, I'm a, I'm a lunch and dinner guy myself. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, we're going to get into uh, a lot of stuff much deeper in uh, as we move forward. So I, I really appreciate you uh, no, giving thank you some, for having some answers. Me, Nada, it's great to have you in the studio with me today. Uh, really appreciate your time. Um, we are going to go forward with a, a bit of a quick fire so the audience can get to know you a bit better. Uh, so what was your first job? Selling tablecloths to tourists on the streets of Florence. What did you do before getting into the tech and venture ecosystem? I was a founder and I was an operator in the tech industry for 15 years. What triggered your move into 360 Capital? Uh I got into investing my own money in, in as, as a business angel, uh, got really interested in VC, uh, knew the 360 Capital folks. Uh, there was a good level of trust. They were looking for a profile like myself. So it was really opportunistic. I'm glad I managed to join them, and it's been a nice ride since 2016. And what would you be doing if you hadn't have gone into venture? Probably been doing more personal investing in startups and, and, uh, and more teaching. Excellent. Uh, 360 Capital, tell me what the AUM is, what stages and verticals, what geographies, what check size. Got it. It's, uh, the firm's been around uh, since 97, so uh, we focus uh, on our investments, our, uh, our, our geography is, is Europe, continental Europe. Uh, main focus, France and Italy. Uh, broad base uh, investments, uh, but you can sort of classify them in three categories, uh, digital technologies, deep tech, and uh, climate and energy transition tech. Three companies from inside or outside the portfolio that you're really excited about? I would say I, I'd name you one from three different countries. Uh, Prophecy, a French uh, deep tech startup uh, focusing on building uh, a neuromorphic image sensor for the world of AI. Uh, we have Energy Dome, which is an Italian company based in Milan, and they are building uh, a, a very innovative uh, long-term energy storage, a key component of the energy transition puzzle. And um, and Iris Risk, it's a it's, it's a very innovative cybersecurity uh, company from Spain. Uh, uh, it's done phenomenally well. It's a, it's a re fairly recent investment. So in three years, they've more than uh, uh, you know they've increased their revenue by more than 10x, and uh, uh, we're very positive on them. Amazing. One final question: Breakfast, lunch, or dinner? I love dinner. Excellent. <laughs> Cool. I think that was. I think that worked. Yeah, I think that that, that, that well did it, man. That was good. Yeah. That was good. Love it. Chat's good too. Yeah. Okay. That's fun. That was man, fun. We're pros. We're pros. <laughs> we're like, pros. Uh, that's Jesse, by the way. He's hey, Jesse. He, he'll he'll act. He's the youngster. How old are you? Fifteen. Eighteen. Eighteen. He's he, he, so, so this is the only podcast he apparently listens to. Does he really? Out of all awesome. of the podcasts that good to meet you, Jesse. Nice to meet you. All the best. Sweet. Sweet. Jesse, go for it, man. Cut. Uh, <laughs> one thing, Jesse. So I don't know if you caught all of that, but we basically... I told you. You've done... Okay, fine. Excellent. All right. So now... So for the main episode, do I do I now go, not a great having in the studio again? Or yeah, do... do it same as normal. Okay. Which and then you'll cut, you'll cut yeah, as... Yeah, okay. And then we'll do the intro at the end. Yeah, yeah, fine. Okay. Thank you. How was that? That was awesome. Sweet. That was perfect. That was perfect. Good. I mean, like, I'm we're, we're, we're figuring it out. It. We're, bang, figu bang, we're bang. figuring it out as we go a little <laughs> bit as well. Like, the thing is, you got to try different things and, and see what sticks, right? Sure, sure, sure. Um, good to go? Wow, well, absolutely. 
not a great to have you in the studio with My me. Um, really appreciate you taking the time. Uh, let's get stuck right in. Uh, you are part of the uh, founding management team at CHL, which created one of Italy's first e-com providers, ultimately leading the company through a listing in Milan, something we don't hear about <laughs> happening too much these days, I don't think. Uh, tell me what it was like riding the wave of the dot-com boom in the early noughties, especially, I guess, somewhere like Italy, where, where you don't necessarily think of it as being, I guess, at the forefront of sort of tech and innovation in, in that same way that, that, that you look at the US for argument's Absolutely. sake. Absolutely. I mean, th those were phenomenal times. I mean, I, I ended up in Italy uh, for personal reasons. I, I met my wife while I was, uh, was doing a master's at MIT, and we decided to get married, move to Italy. Happens to the I, best I, of I, us. I, yeah. I'd always wanted to get into the tech space. I mean, there was this incredible enthusiasm, uh, particularly at the university level, uh, you know, places like MIT and sort of riding this information technology revolution. You know, 97, 98, as you know, was just the beginning of the dot-com boom. Um, but, you know, I decided to come to Italy and there wasn't much of an ecosystem there. So I ended up back in consulting. I worked a year in McKinsey. And <laughs> oddly enough, uh, one of my roommates when I was living in Florence when I was in high school had started a, you know, an e-commerce startup in Italy. And so uh, th these are just the weird circumstances in life where he, he you know, he got some uh, VC money and uh, they told him, well, you, you need people, you know, proper management to join you mm. and all that as, mm. as, you know, and and he, uh, this guy goes, wh where do I find these people? It's like, well, you know, they work in places like McKinsey, you, you know, it's, I know one guy who works for McKinsey. <laughs> so he rings me up and, and I'm like, yeah, I'm all for it. And uh and, and I remember I, I was I talked to my partner at the time about leaving and joining a startup in Florence. And this is this company was based in Florence, mm. and people thought I was mad. Yeah. I mean, it just wasn't a thing to leave a good job with with a high profile company and a career to to join a startup. Uh, I, I, I think Europe was a bit behind the U.S. when it comes to sort of that kind of risk taking in your career and. Uh, but it was an incredible journey because uh, we, we, you know, I joined this firm. Uh, we grew really fast. Uh, we raised more money. Uh, we listed the company, and it became uh, really the foundation of what, it, what, what I wanted to do in life. I, I really never went back. Um, so yeah, uh, that was the start of it. And, and I guess you know, in terms of that ecosystem at the time, and the euphoria around the kind of dot com dot com. Uh, period, how, like how much of that flowed over into Italy? Was it? W did it feel like part of that same global kind of experience around dot com? Quite or? a bit, quite a bit. Yeah. I mean, I think the madness was pervasive all around the world. Yeah. I mean, uh, you you had, I, I wouldn't say to the same level of intensity as there was in the U.S. and perhaps maybe even the U.K. I'm not quite familiar with what happened in the U.K. at the time I wasn't living here, but but uh, you you also had sort of this period of six months to a year maybe it was shorter because it caught on a bit later yeah but it, it really had the same effect when it came to sort of influx of capital the enthusiasm for these kinds of companies uh and uh you know the general media hype around you know the the, the potential of the internet to to disrupt and we all know what happened after that you know there was uh there was a bust uh, there was uh, there was a period of uh let's say intense soul searching I, I, I kind of feel like you also had a lot of tourists joining this because I remember sort of six months after I left McKinsey, there was a wave of people leaving McKinsey to join. Yeah. And then a few months later, money dried up. Uh, projects ended up sort of, uh, uh, you know, being suspended or, or, or not proceeding. And, and a lot of people went back into consulting and sort of uh, I was lucky enough to stay, stick around uh, and uh, do a few other projects that really defined the course of my career in the tech scene. It's really interesting, actually, because I, I guess if you juxtapose what happened then with, with you know, startup doctrine today, like one of the main doctrines is never hire from like McKinsey or banking or whatever, right? Like you, like there's this very strong trope, I guess, within startups that if you come from that kind of corporate consulting background, often you don't have the skill set to really get stuck into kind of an early stage startup. And I get maybe, maybe I, there's a I'm, balance. I'm not sure because I wasn't very senior. Remember at the time I was 27, 28, I right. was an associate. I, I tend to agree. I, I think it's challenging to go and get someone with seven, eight years of experience in McKinsey mm. in that stage of a, of, of a startup, sort of almost as a co-founder. Uh, but 
I, I think, you know, the skill set of people who, who spend a few years in consulting uh, is fairly compatible. And they haven't been that sort of deeply indoctrinated yeah. to, to not sort of... Uh, although I have to say, I had quite a bit of adjusting and adapting to do. Uh, I, I had to learn a lot. Uh, but, you know, people in their sort of mid to late 20s, they are more flexible, uh, I think, in general, in, in, in learning things and adapting. Uh, so it's not entirely unwarranted, I would say. Yeah, no, so I, I think I'd, I'd agree with that. It's 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 whether they have learned the right, not not had enough time to learn the wrong lessons, right, of being right. in a corporate, like, you yeah. know, the politics, the bureaucracy, but, but having that flexibility. But equally, and I guess this is where, you know, if you are a consultant, the things you can bring to a startup are obviously, um, you know, things like problem solving, you know, critical yeah, thinking intensity, skills. Yeah, intensity, you know, even a level of organization, yeah. some best practices. But uh, I mean, a startup, especially in that stage, is very chaotic. Yeah. Correct. And it, it requires people with an element of flexibility that can adapt. Mm. So, and, and I think consulting firms, to the extent that they throw you from one project to another and you're, you're expected to sort of very quickly learn something and contribute, they're very good at that. But I think when it comes to your compatibility in joining the startup scene, hmm. there are diminishing returns after year three and four Got in, it. In, in consulting. I mean, that that's where you become institutionalized. You become senior, become too expensive, you know, uh, too risk averse. Uh, you stop doing things operationally. You know, you can't hmm. even book your flight because you've got secretaries <laughs> doing that for you, you know. so Thankfully um, not there yet. Yeah. I know. Okay, I know. Yeah, yeah. So I think the sweet spot in getting people or for people to jump into uh, the startup scene at that early stage, later stages, that's different. It's, yeah. But at the early stage is sort of maybe, you know, three to four years max. Yeah. Yeah. And and I think, again, you're right, because I think there's there, there are sort of it's a, it's a sliding scale. Right. So if you're a consultant that co-founds a startup, that's one thing because like, and there are plenty of those. And actually, there are lo yeah. lots mm -hmm. and lots mm -hmm. of those. Right. Because you've come across those problems. Correct. You've seen like a deep problem set that you're trying to solve. And then you, you think about what solutions you may build. There's a difference between that person versus someone that says, hey, listen, I feel like I want to go into startup and tries to join an early stage startup versus someone coming at Series A, Series B, Correct. where actually that's the money's set, already there. It's the money's like, yeah. there. The skill set is is more required and actually often in those sort of businesses, especially when they're B2B, obviously you are talking to people of a similar nature to correct, that individual correct. and actually having correct. that experience and, right. and expertise makes sense. So so moving from there, Bravo Solution, you pivoted from a marketplace to providing solutions in the procurement and supply management space. So talk us through that pivot because I think we're going to see a lot of this this year yeah. and why it, it's essential for founders to have that mindset. And how you landed on SaaS as a survival strategy, because at that stage, no one had ever really even heard of it. No, term to be honest, before. yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's an interesting story. Because uh, let me give you some context, because this whole hype was around internet changing commerce. Mm -hmm. And for people, commerce was consumer commerce, yep. correct? Yep. And that led to this massive hype with huge amounts of money coming in. But as most often happens in technology, you know, there are over expectations and under delivery. I mean, these things ended up materializing, but kind of 10 years later, correct? So when there was that level of disappointment, there was this crash of this dot-com boom. But at the same time, you started a different boom. I would say a smaller boom, which was I would call the B2B commerce boom. Mm. Uh, that kind of happened between late 90s and sort of uh, mid-2001. Mm -hmm. And that was sort of a thesis that, look, the real opportunity isn't really in consumer commerce, most commerce is actually business to business, mm. correct? Mm. And um, why don't we sort of apply the magic of internet to improve that process and and create opportunities for uh, big players to come in and build the operating system of commerce in that in that. So there were these sort of fantastic plans of creating these marketplaces. This is like uh, where these, Amazon but essentially Yeah, I mean, and... I don't know if you remember, there was Vertical Net, uh, Commerce One. Mm. These were companies that sort of built, let's say, Alibaba-style marketplaces uh, for businesses to trade. Mm. And uh, with hardly any revenue, they listed on NASDAQ and they were worth billions. I think Vertical Net, uh, a company, by the way, that we, you know, 10 years later bought for six million dollars yeah. <laughs> correct again my I company think bought for six million dollars was worth like 11 billion i think yeah, at the yeah. time i think we're going to see a few and, of those and, this and, year and, as well uh, <laughs> and and 
sort of the thesis there was that you're going to build these marketplaces and companies, large and small, are going to come in there and start trading, correct? Mm -hmm. uh, th that really never materialized. So, so that sort of led to a bunch of people theorizing that these marketplaces, in order, because the problem was liquidity, they said, all right, in order to have liquidity, you need large companies to pool their procurement budgets, all right? And these large companies could be the founders of these vertical marketplaces, uh, like a marketplace in automotive, a marketplace in airlines, and so forth. And that was sort of, you know, the context in which we were born. You know, our predominant financier and shareholder was a, a, a large, the world's fourth, the third or fourth largest cement company. It's, uh, it's an Italian uh, family-owned multinational and also was listed, I believe, at the time. And... Uh, uh, you know, the family at the time, they, they felt that uh, this was the right approach for them to go. And they, they, uh, they sort of they engaged a bunch of people as, as uh, like us, as co-founders of this project mm. to, uh, to launch this marketplace in the construction industry, correct? <laughs> and by the, by the time, I mean, we started this, we realized that, you know, it was, it's a fascinating and romantic concept but procurement is not something that large corporations really want to collaborate. It's actually a strategic thing. It's a thing where, you know, having a certain level of visibility and disclosure is not something that is right competitively. Correct? Yeah, it's so detrimental. It's to detrimental them. Yeah, to yeah. competitiveness. So, uh, you know, these organizations rarely manage to even engage their own shareholders to submit their key procurement volumes into these marketplaces. Uh, we were kind of lucky because uh, our shareholders started the project and they had not sort of assembled a bunch of other cement companies. So by the time we realized that, look, the strategy of creating a, a, a sector-specific marketplace financed by multiple shareholders, corporations, is, is a failing one, uh, we, we, we didn't have trouble to go to a single shareholder and try to explain to them that, look, this is a failing strategy and we need to pivot to, to something else. And, and, at, and at the time, just going out and talking to potential, uh, you know, to, to procurement departments in these various large corporates, we identified an area that was quite an interesting area, an area of, uh, you know, negotiating contracts with suppliers, mm. uh, which was an area where the Internet could make a real impact because you had all sorts of automations already within organizations but these were automations of business processes that were internal. Yeah, yeah so they self, the information self information was often highly structured, mm -hmm. okay, and it was being exchanged within the organization. When you're when you're talking about contracting and awarding contracts and tendering with your suppliers, a you're dealing with a lot of unstructured information. So the specifications for buying, I don't know, a cleaning service, correct, mm -hmm. is not structured information. It's a document with all sorts of uh, specifications around your requirements and so forth. And in addition to that, you have a large stakeholder group, okay, that is outside, sitting outside your organization. So internet could be the right conduit, all right, to build a tool so that those exchanges that were happening largely at best by email mm. could be sort of set out in a way that they could but be almost governed, only controlled by, and so forth. But almost only by fax in those days. Or fax yeah. or, or letters, God knows, yeah, yeah. you know. Uh, I said at best was email. Yeah, yeah. So, so really when we looked at that process, we said this is where we really need to focus on, not sort of uh, the process of, uh, let's say, more close to the accounting and the transactional side of procurement where contracts are awarded, but all of the things that are exchanged between your procurement department and the outside for a procurement decision to be formulated so for pre a contract the, pre to the be PO. awarded, yeah, correct? Pre-PO, correct. Yeah. And that, that was a whole world, and there was nothing there at all, correct? And so we built this lovely tool. Uh, it's a web-based tool. We went out there, started selling it in 2001, and uh, nobody was buying it. <laughs> just, just interestingly enough, why nobody was buying it? Because, look, you, you're in 2001. Startups aren't really that sexy. Uh, large corporates, you know, selling enterprise solutions – you know, IT departments are not in the business of buying things from, you know, 15-person companies that have less than, you know, they're less than a year old, correct? So we were being given no credit. I mean, although our approach was the classic approach of trying to go and sell licensed software because we'd built software, we'd convinced our shareholders that the marketplace, you know, model was no longer, uh, you know, the right business model to pursue. 
And, um, you know, we were very close to closing the business because we were unable to actually secure any meaningful, let's say, software contract. Mm. Uh, procurement people loved our product, okay? But we just couldn't get the, past the IT decision-making process. And this would have been sort of decisions in This is in two, the... end of 2001, 2002. And we're correct. talking six-figure kind of procurement yeah, decisions. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's what, what, what you try to go for, yeah, correct? Yeah. Because at the time, you, you really... Because in the apps, you know, the other beauty of SaaS is you can start small and scale. But if you want to go out there and tell people you got to buy servers, you got to set up things, you know, the whole infrastructure you got to put in play to get your application up and running does not warrant you setting a ten or twenty thousand euro project, mm -hmm, correct? Mm -hmm. And um, so, you know, left with the option of not being able to crack this sort of you know enterprise software sale thing and and closing the business. Uh, you know, we went and we told our customers, hey, you love this software. Your IT doesn't want to buy it. They want to wait for IBM, Oracle, SAP to provide that. And they don't have these tools. Uh, why don't you keep using this product and pay us a monthly fee from your services <laughs> budget? Correct? And he said, after all, look, you know, this is hosted by us. It's on our servers. Uh, we can make it available to you through a browser. And uh, you, you've got your own budget and you can pay for it. And 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 to be honest, we signed up our first customers like that. I mean, and and... We weren't really visionaries in SaaS. You know, SaaS for us was a survival strategy. Yep. You know, it was a way to stay alive and keep the business going by being able to serve our customers. And and um, it, it was it was kind of fascinating because then that led to other decisions because we realized that we had to sort of re-architect our back end to be able to actually efficiently deliver multiple instances to multiple clients. Uh, so, so this whole multi-tenant approach. Remember, there were no tools, no, no, no existing architecture. So we had to sort of build a ground. I mean, up AWS approach. didn't exist. No, no, no. There was stuff. no such thing as yeah, clouds and yeah. so so forth. So, so <clears throat> we we ended up sort of building those uh, <clears throat> those capabilities grounds up so that we can actually optimize and leverage our infrastructure to deliver from same set of servers with one upfront investment, multiple clients, and scale from there. Uh, fast forward. I, I don't know. The funny thing is we were temporarily the solution provider to our clients. We couldn't even use the word software because, hmm. uh, you know, software then would just throw us into the domain of, of IT and they would say, oh, this is an investment and all that. And so we were temporarily solution providers to some large corporates for like 10 or 12 years. Wow. You know, uh, they, they were still our clients by the time I left and they were sort of they were having these temporary contracts as they were still awaiting, let's say, the solution. I, I would say... When we were talking to investors at the time, they also felt that what we were doing was complete madness because no one in their right mind would have told you that large corporates would ever accept to put their enterprise solutions in and the, the data in the hands of yeah. a third party, let yeah. alone a startup, Yeah, correct? But today, it's entirely socially acceptable. You have very large corporations running most of their systems on the cloud and so forth. But you have to sort of, when you look back at the time in the early 2000s, people weren't willing to even invest in our company mm. on the basis that we were chasing, you know, a mad dream. Because it was not even contemplated that companies would dismantle their internal IT infrastructure and rely on third parties for this type of application delivery, which has now become the norm. Yeah. Now it has become the norm. And if you think about it, it has huge, immense advantages uh, in terms of flexibility, in terms of, uh, you know, uh, speed of deployment. Um, I also found out, you know, by the way, having worked for Accenture, I was part of this whole, you know, insanity. You know, the, the, the inefficiency of replicating Harvard infrastructure within every single client yeah. for the same, infra you know, for the same application, that aside, you know, this also created the incentive for a whole series, okay, of, you know, I would say poor practices mm. to be engaged by customers, you know, over-complicated projects, over-customized solutions, which essentially sort of enlarged the budget of IT departments, um, you know, created significant incentives for large system integrators to, uh, to promote that. I think at the time, you know, we, we even tried to engage system integrators, but we saw a huge conflict of interest because these projects that were overly complex well, can, cannibalizes their own exactly, revenue. Exactly, right? cannibalize like, the revenue. So you don't want out of the out of the box software that can be deployed within two weeks when you can charge customers a one year deployment project with the whole team of consultants on site. Mm. So, 
we, we had to fight a lot of battles to get through that nonsense. So I think the world we live in today is largely also because of the efforts of you know desperate people like us in trying to condition, educate. Um, I think 2008 was pivotal because mm. uh, on the one hand, I think the crisis, the worldwide crisis and sort of the credit crunch on the one hand helped focus more uh, the attention of top management of these large corporations on the procurement function, because mm -hmm. in good times you really don't think about don't how care. well you're buying things. Yeah. So that sort of spurred demand for you know investing in technology and procurement. And uh, secondly, uh, it also focused the attention of many customers on how much they're spending on IT. Mm -hmm. Does it really make sense for us to buy information technology the way we're buying it? So there was much more openness towards things that were more flexible, they were quicker to deploy, and they were they had a lower overall cost of ownership. Hey guys, sorry to interrupt. I just wanted to introduce you to our sponsor. This episode is sponsored by Emerge One. Emerge One CFOs partner with VC-backed founders from C to Series B to manage and raise capital and plan how it should be deployed, controlling cash so that they can do what they do best to scale strategically. You can find them at emergeone.co.uk. That's E-M-E-R-G-E-O-N-E dot -E -E co dot UK. Okay, let's get back to the episode. Am I talking too much about this whole SaaS thing? No, God, no. I'm like, I'm sitting, I'm literally sat here. I'm going like, like, so, because exactly as you say, just like the broader that, picture about what we did. No, yeah. I mean, no, look, I oh, mean, we I, were a tiny piece of this whole, I think, movement, but yeah, but, but, but that movement has essentially created the world, the world we live in today. Like I couldn't imagine yeah. uh, an organization today not using some form of, yeah, I mean, of SaaS we, we, solution, we, you right? also, you also look at other secondary aspect, which really didn't apply to us because the kind of software we were selling was purely enterprise. But mm. if you look at it, SaaS also made software affordable and adoptable by medium and smaller organizations. And by consumers, you right? Could, like exactly, across, and yeah. also consumers. But you, as, as an SME, I mean, you couldn't afford to spend hundreds of thousands up front to buy a CRM solution. You know, now you have extremely sophisticated, it, it became all, almost like it, it democratized mm. I think information technology. Yeah, and that level of democratization also led to, I think, fundamental changes in, you know, in our economic system, mm. whereby the inherent advantages that large corporations had because they could make those kinds of investments to access, you know, productivity-led uh, IT, they were also available to small businesses. You can start a business with a few clicks and and have right off the bat an HR system an affordable CRM system, an affordable accounting system, all of these things you have to understand that were not very much available. And that also for the startup ecosystem, it's a great way uh, because it simplifies, reduces the barriers uh, for small companies to uh, to compete. Yeah, I mean, with larger companies. The, the, so the, the I think that there's a, there's a bigger picture with this whole SaaS thing that uh, uh, doesn't necessarily apply to us individually, so as, as a company, yeah. as my company, Bravo Solution, uh, but that I can see being one of the largest benefits of SaaS being deployed uh, sort of beyond the enterprise. No, uh, look, 100%. I mean, like the, the obvious example from for, for, a, for a number cruncher like me is like what Xero has done in, in the accounting and, and, and finance space, right? I mean, like, you know, software solutions of the likes of SAP and Oracle, we're talking hundreds, you know, even, even Microsoft Dynamics, et cetera, like we're talking hundreds of thousands of dollars, pounds to implement, but all of a sudden, you know, a guy sitting on his couch or a girl sitting in the coffee shop or whatever with 20 pounds a month can get there and can do the work themselves because they made it so easy that it, and, and understandably you could do it. And and yeah, I mean, like, I think, I mean, there's, we're going to have some people on the podcast soon, I hope, you know, they, they were part of the team that exited um, uh, Signal Labs Semantic. And I think there was a very similar story. Like it Correct. was sort of this HR solutions, which they ended up turning into SaaS because like, that was the only way that it worked but it's just to your point not only has it not only has it opened up and lowered the costs for large organizations it's opened up access for smaller organizations and allowed them to compete uh at, 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 on a level playing field right. almost, i consider right? it the great equalizer i think yeah, when it exactly. comes to those kinds of capabilities yeah um 
amazing and I'm, I'm sure we could talk about it for a lot longer but let's move to 360 capital which is where you are now sure so you you don't as a firm invest that much in the uk and you and i have talked about kind of adverse selection in the uk specifically around access to deal flow so talk us through the pain points there and equally what the state of the ecosystem is in europe for example you know the, i believe there are similar schemes to kind of the seis and eis schemes here in the uk in other european countries some uh, in fact have been recently announced how do you think that those are and will impact are impacting and will impact kind of uh, the ecosystem and, and how will they encourage the next wave of startups to be built i guess there's sort of two questions like what is what is it about the uk that is tough and i guess what is what is happening in Correct. europe i mean it, 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 it's fairly simple i think it's it's obvious that uk is one of the most prosperous most mature most competitive markets for, for venture capital. Mm -hmm. uh, you have well over 100 VC funds, well over 50 that are focusing on early stage. They have very good coverage. It's probably, you know, one of the few places outside of US and China where you have comparable, let's say, level of maturity when it comes to access uh, to- yeah. uh, But still probably 20 to, years to behind capital. the US. But uh, yeah. Probably, I wouldn't say 20, but maybe four or five years behind sure. the US. Okay. It's a smaller country, obviously, and so yeah. forth. Uh, but it's, uh, it's very competitive as a VC to operate in. And when you're in early stage, uh, access to deal flow is critical. Uh, founders don't like to do fundraising. <laughs> So, and good founders want to spend the least amount of time fundraising and get the best names on their cap table as quickly as possible. So if you were a founder and you were a top guy or girl, you would, uh, you'd reach out to the f top five or 10 names that you know in your local ecosystem. And, and the other thing is, you know, early stage investments or early stage fundraising is very domestic. Mm. There isn't, yeah. you, you, you can't really effectively deploy money cross border and write checks in the 500,000, 2 million, 3 million euros. So you really have to concentrate on your own ecosystem if mm -hmm. you want to be the first check into these companies. So uh, what ends up happening is if you are not one of the top names in your domestic market, uh, you know, your inbound is largely the rejects of others. Yeah. So, uh, and uh, if you don't have enough firepower to effectively reach out. And it's very, very difficult to reach out at that early stage because there's very little information about these yep. founders and so forth. Uh, so you, there's an over-reliance on networking and, and inbound. Mm. And, uh, and uh, on that basis, very difficult for, I mean, it would be difficult for a UK find to operate in France yeah. or Italy 100%. because the French founders or Italian founders would much rather go to the top two or three or five names that they know within their ecosystem. Uh, um, sometimes they have also easier and better access to mm -hmm. the partners of those firms uh, to reach out to them and, and showcase their projects. Uh, so, so in a sense, um, our focus stays continental Europe. Uh, we have a very, very strong uh, brand recognition in France and Italy, where we've operated for well over 20 years. Mm -hmm. um, I would say, uh, you know, the last 10 years, we've made uh, quite a bit of investments also in Spain. So we're becoming better known in Spain. We have good relationship with other VCs uh, in Spain with whom we collaborate and we, we, we do joint investments. Um, and then we opportunistically look across Europe, including we have a few investments in the UK, but these are things that we have actually sectors or themes that we have pinpointed and focused on. And we did the outreach and typically there was not seed, but mostly Series A investments where uh, where we, we already have a very strong thesis and see some metrics and evidence of product market fit uh, to, to, to go and play. Um, I mean, you also asked about the overall sort of, you know, where we stand, uh, the situation. I mean, I can probably best comment on France and Italy, which are our core sure. markets. About 70% of our investments are in these two countries. Uh, France, together, I think, with Germany, they are not at the same level as the UK, but they've made significant strides over the last, uh, I would say, 10 years. Mm -hmm. uh, the French ecosystem is fairly sophisticated. Uh, uh, they're beginning to cover all stages of investment with domestic funds. Uh, the volume of, uh, of, of, of money that's being deployed in startups, the number of unicorns, all of these things are uh, have been uh, quite phenomenal, I would say, in terms of their, uh, their growth. Um, Italy, unfortunately, is a bit behind. <laughs> Uh, but, uh, you know, 
I think over the next 10 years, Italy is where most of the growth could be, uh, because unlike the other countries, uh, it's starting from a much lower base. Mm. There are only a handful of funds. Uh, and, and so there's very good opportunities for growth in Italy. And uh, there's a lot of there are a lot of talented entrepreneurs. There's, uh, there's a lot of very there are a lot of very talented institutions when it comes to technology and R&D. Um, uh, so the country uh, has the capability and the opportunities. It needs capital and it needs that whole ecosystem of of. Uh, of investors or professional investors yeah. uh, to develop in order to support those kinds of projects. And, and I would also argue in Italy, it probably also needs not government intervention. What it needs is, I, I guess, a better understanding of what the tech and venture ecosystem actually sure, is. Sure. I think governments be. also in Italy, I would say in the last couple of administrations have given quite high level of priority to, I mean, there's a better understanding that modern economies compete on innovation <laughs> and the foundation is is no longer about making cheap manufactured goods but make making high-tech products that can compete globally and uh, so on that basis also when it comes to government policy we've seen quite significant improvements mm -hmm. uh, kind of things that let's say France and Germany did uh, let's say 10 years ago are beginning to be aggressively pushed in Italy uh, and uh, that is also helping on the one hand uh, you know, the creation of new funds or uh, the creation of funds that support later stages. Mm -hmm. uh, so generally, there's an attempt by the institutions to encourage uh, and, and foster uh, the, the tech ecosystem. So th that's all very positive. It's happened late. Mm. It's happened later than other places in Europe, but it's certainly happening. Yeah, yeah. I, I think one of the things, and I think this is a kind of broader point around Europe, but certainly was made about one of the, uh, by one of the in Italian investors I, I've had on, um, who you no doubt know, Antonio Avitabile from, oh, yeah. from Sony of Ventures a Corporation. And one of, the, one of the points he made was that in Italy, but in Europe more broadly, we don't have quite, so, so two things. First of all, we don't quite have the caliber of founder um, that you maybe get in the US because not enough entrepreneurs, there haven't been enough massive scale uh, uh, companies in Europe uh, to allow people to kind of understand what going through that entire journey through to kind of you know a, a, a large exit is. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure. I, I agree. Okay. I think a lot of disagreements that, always good. I, I I you know a lot of folks that are doing business in the U.S. are you know originally from Europe or sure. from outside the U.S. So I, I don't think this has to do with talent or attitude. I think it has to do with. Um, uh, with opportunity. Got it. Uh, you know, Europe, you cannot compare Europe to, to US. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it's much harder to do really extremely ambitious things from Europe, mm -hmm. particularly in sectors like consumer sectors, mm -hmm. correct? So think about, you don't Because you don't have that homogeneity. You don't have people, that level yeah. of homogeneity. So if you're in the US, you can throw a lot of money at something, 100, 200 mil, and scale. Mm -hmm. Scale fast, mm -hmm. correct? And if it's a winner takes all thing if it's a project that has significant network externalities associated with it you can have a lot of investments and attract them with it on the basis that you can come big and on that basis even go and invade europe and all that kind of stuff correct mm -hmm. far harder to execute that strategy in europe far around. harder because mm -hmm. europe is not just one homogenous place like us or china you know for you to scale even a, a you know a fairly basic consumer uh, you know, uh, play or innovative consumer play, uh, you have a lot of complexities. You have a lot of complexities to deploy that across, the, you know, the so-called 300 million, you know, plus person that are in the European Well, European I mean, you've got to look at it from a country so, by country perspective. Where so it's, it's harder to execute. It's harder to scale quickly. Uh, in places like Italy, for example, these projects are so overambitious that uh, most investors don't feel like touching them because they know that they know that the level of investments required uh, and the pace of fundraising is such uh, that the local ecosystem cannot support. And therefore, you can quickly and easily be outcompeted by larger players uh, from either UK, Germany, or mm -hmm. most likely also US. Mm. Uh, so I, I think the challenge, th there, there is, mind you, things are changing, but in a world where you have a lot of capital, uh, Ecosystems that are not as mature as the U.S. 
have a competitive disadvantage because your competitors can raise a lot of money mm. and regardless on uh, and and regardless of how well they execute they can be far more inefficient than you but if they have much more capital than you they can still outcompete yeah so you. capital capital is a weapon essentially right Correct. Like just uh, th there are exceptions i mean if you play in deep tech or if you play in spaces where uh, the technology itself inherently is a barrier to entry uh, those uh, become areas whereby, you know, having a lot more money may not necessarily make a difference. Yeah. Uh, nevertheless, even a B2B play, scaling across the U.S. is a lot easier than scaling across Europe. Yeah, for sure. Uh, because you can't just get, you know, a head of sales for, for Northern Europe and bundle, I don't know, Germany, U.K. and Scandinavia together. You still have to get people who speak Swedish on, on the ground. You, you've got to get people who have good network and good... Uh, capabilities and presentation skills, and you have to might have to adapt your product to the local markets, the various local markets, the rules and regulations that you have to abide by. So even B two B is something that um, that uh, is is harder to scale across Europe. So I, I would say you have an inherent disadvantage, which might structurally sort of induce some ambitious founders to go and look for fortunes to start their businesses in the U.S., Yeah, correct? Yeah, it's just but easier I, to I, get I'm not sure it's an attitude thing. Uh, I think, you know, things in the last 20 years have changed a lot. Uh, in my time, a lot of people were kind of jumping into entrepreneurship because of lack of choice sometimes. But now you're getting, you know, really talented people. I see young people who have a lot of opportunities, a lot of, you know, potential to get into and do careers in consulting and banking and so forth, dropping those things to get into this. Mm. And uh, I think from that perspective, I don't think we have anything to, uh, um, you know, I, I don't think that is a, you know, we, we don't have anything less than the U.S. Yeah. I, I think... The talent and, and uh, the, the, the desire uh, to launch technology startups and change the world are, is, is as intense among the youth uh, and, and the, 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 let's say, the up-and-coming generation in Europe as there is in the U.S. Amazing. Well, that's a really optimistic take, uh, and, and, and it's good to hear it. So may, maybe, well, I don't know, it might be optimistic, maybe pessimistic, but thinking about the state of the ecosystem in 2024, what do you think we're going to see over the next 12 to 24 months? And I guess through the work that you do at Bocconi, where you where you teach, uh, where do you see the next cohort of entrepreneurs focusing? Uh, do you think we're going to see more in the deep tech space, where 360 Capital invests, sure. obviously, as you say? Or do you think we'll continue to see multiple examples of like software startups being built, despite kind of that slowdown in capital deployment? Sure. I, I, I tend to be, I understand we've had like the whole tech ecosystem has had a pretty tough 2023 mm. and maybe part of 2022. There's been a significant correction in valuations. There's a lot less money available. But I can assure you, if you look, these are the right times to start a business and the right times to invest. Mm -hmm. This is precisely, if you look at it, after every time there was a downturn, those were like great companies were created. Obviously, there's less capital. We ourselves have to be much more selective. Uh, but at the same time, there's a lot less nonsense. <laughs> Remember this whole sort of capital penalty that I mentioned to you yeah. that, you know, you're very good, you're very enthusiastic, but you can't get things going because people are skeptical because someone else with a piece of paper has raised just 100 mil with a promise of doing just about what you, you, what you wanted to do. So I think I saw the benefit of that when we launched Bravo Solution sort of in the, in, in the let's say, meager years of 2001 and 2004. There was a lot less US-based competition in Europe for software. There was a lot less of a nonsense in terms of, you know, large projects coming in and, you know, pretending to sell vaporware. Uh, much more focus on building products, serving customers, focusing on product market fit. Uh, the level of intense hype that we had between 20, let's like, say 18, 19, 2021, 20, I don't think it necessarily benefited founders. <laughs> no, no, I think it, it actually did the opposite. Because you had this mad rush because you had to, you were forced to raise, you were forced to burn, correct? And you almost lost touch because the goal was solely and exclusively hitting the milestone of raising the next round. Now, and, and we were part of that, and we had to have that conversation with our founders as well. Get as fast as possible to raise that next round because... 
you know, for every project that we had, there were 10 or 15 other projects backed by other people around the world, and we didn't want, so we didn't want to be left behind. We didn't want our founders to be outcompeted. Now, I, you know, still being in this business is, is a high adrenaline and high intensity. It hasn't reduced that, but it has taken, it, it has taken the edge off of it mm. and is allowing founders to really focus much more on what makes sense, pacing their investments, pacing their runway in such a way that actually makes business sense rather than sort of targeting it for, you know, meeting certain metrics regardless of how much, you know, the concept of capital efficiency, it's actually a good thing, although we don't want, you know, necessarily to build a profitable business. We want to buy a growing business. But in that world of hype, there was almost no consideration mm. because, you know, for you, capital was almost unlimited. Therefore, in order to compete, you just had to grow at all costs. And that created all sorts of structural issues within these organizations that at some point had to be addressed mm. because they were not robustly built from grounds up. I think these are years where founders can actually build companies in a fairly robust way grounds up. It's still, as I said, it's still a high risk. It's still almost a miracle for you to create a business that's worth 100 million, 200 million and above. You know, you still have to be extremely good. You have to work 20 hours a day. That's not gone, correct? But you are a lot more focused on what makes sense for your business mm. and decisions that are not just short-term, but also medium and long-term beneficial for your organization. So I'm fairly positive because, because less capital doesn't necessarily mean that the sector is going to be in difficulty. I think- It just means better, less noise. Less noise, better, more robust projects coming out better returns for investors, which is going to drive more money coming into the sector. Uh, and and th this, I would say, this is on the overall ecosystem side. Then when it comes to themes, clearly we continue, you know, being in continental Europe, uh, you know, I would say 360 in its first, let's say, 10 or 12 years was very much into sort of backing founders that had sort of copycat business models from the US and executing extremely fast and well, mostly consumer. Kind of like the rocket internet. Kind of like, but that was mostly the successful strategy of a lot of early mm. VCs in the 2000s, mm. correct? US play is gonna come to Europe maybe a few years later. Let's find talented people. Get ahead of the Get a curve. head start, get ahead of the curve. Yeah. Let's back them. This happened in all sorts of different spaces. In a sense, even my project, you know, Bravo Solution was almost a copycat of other players like Ariba and, and Free Markets. These were pl plays in the U.S. that we emulated here in Europe. And, uh, but, you know, in 2015, 16, in 360, there was more of an understanding that if we want to be competitive, we have to actually not just focus on what worked in the U.S., mm. but work on projects that have a, a deep technological angle to them that can be defended because we can never grow and, and, and scale as fast as the US players. We saw a lot more cap capital coming in. If it took you know large US plays, maybe two or three or four years to get to Europe, now it took them a year to come to Europe. Mm. So uh, for us, in terms of competitive strategy, there was much more pivot towards, let's say, uh, tech, you know, projects with an angle of, of technological differentiation. More kind of R&D focused. Correct. So, so yeah. not necessarily, so you, we have a whole range. So we went from, let's say, doing 60, 70% consumer, 30% B2B to the other way. Uh, and that B2B became sort of half, let's say, traditional software B2B, which in any case, there is an angle in terms of capabilities and technological. And also we got into, you know, deep tech, robotics, and things that were also physical, you know, uh, semiconductors, sensors, and things like that. Uh, and, and, and those are, you know, quite capital intensive, uh, super IP, uh, you know, related, Very rich. Uh, yeah. IP rich. And, and, and so, um, and that strategy also led us into investing into uh, climate tech. And I think that's an up and coming theme. So looking forward, I see a number of opportunities. I mean, obviously, this this whole generative AI thing is very exciting for us. Uh, we we were early investors in AI. The stuff is not new. I consider AI and generative AI to be foundational technology. What 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 you know we call general purpose technology. Mm. It also is called GPT, by the way. Yeah, yeah. General purpose technologies are amazing things 
that create great opportunities for disruptions, but applications need to be built on, built top, on of top of them. them. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. Uh, think about the internet. It was around since the early 1990s. And really, it took 10 or 15 years for us to understand how to use it to build things. It was until how the, do you, until how do you the browser build was built. You useful could, things, yeah, correct. Yeah, yeah. You needed the browser. You needed... Uh, you know, I talked about us even having to build the basic foundations of what an architecture of multi-tenant delivery of software was going to be. It, it, it's it's going to take similar amount of time, hopefully less. But if you look at the opportunities for disruptions and productivities in various sectors, they are immense. Mm. So we're already beginning to see um, uh, founders coming and looking at what is this technology going to deliver in the next five years? Can I build applications around that? We recently made an investment in, uh, I don't know if we completed that or not, but actually in the procurement space, mm -hmm. uh, this organization is essentially automating the supplier discovery process uh, through, uh, you know, by building essentially a back office that's made, up, made up of bots that reaches mm -hmm. out to suppliers. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you're building capabilities for a procurement function with an infinite number of procurement professionals, yeah. if, if you can use these technologies, correct? Yeah, yeah. You know, certain things you couldn't do before in your back office because it didn't make economic sense. It um, it could now be possible. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's a revolution there happening, and I think we're really on the lookout for projects in that domain. Uh, much less so when it comes to these large infrastructure projects, we consider you know building a language model which requires hundreds of millions, yeah. something that is more of an infrastructure play, which really is not within the scheme of what we could essentially finance from from Europe. I think yeah. not yeah. as effectively. Yeah. There are a couple of projects, but but uh, we we don't really believe that that's the place where we as a firm are going to be playing in. Another dimension we're going to continue to invest. I think you know. Still, the world of sensing needs to be adapted. Uh, uh, you know, AI requires input from the outside world, particularly for things like robotics. Uh, and, you know, our investments in projects like Prophecy, uh, our investments in a world of sensor and semiconductors that is still behind what is necessary for us to have... Uh, you know, signals from the outside world to come in to the AI, for the AI to be able to provide the capabilities that humans have, particularly when navigating the world. Things such as self-driving, autonomous robots, and so mm -hmm. forth. So we have done a number of investments, and we're going to continue that doing that. And the third dimension we're looking at is making things smart, <laughs> okay? Embedding intelligence, I call that. So uh, this is bringing information technology and automation. It could be a combination of software and hardware, to areas that have long been left behind. Mm -hmm. So uh, even products, mm. uh, perhaps industrial processes. Yep. So we have to sort of understand that there are certain industries like banking, like media, et cetera, that have been significantly ahead of the curve when it comes to the use of information technology and the latest and greatest gadgets uh, to try to have productivity. But the world of physical goods, I don't know, a washing machine or God knows, an electric motor, correct? These are things, if you look at it, they are still a bit stuck in the 90s and 2000s, correct? So, and bringing... Even, not even just the physical product, but the Bringing innovation. So I can give you an example. We have uh, an investment in, in, in it's, it's a spinoff of a, of a university in, in northern Italy. This, this company is called New Twin. Essentially, and by the way, this is two investments we've done in digital twin technology, sort of making digital twins runtime. So essentially having digital twins not just being used for design purposes, but using a digital twin of, let's say, an electric motor inside the controller, yeah. correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that that digital twin in real time can feed you things such as the temperature of a particular spot within the digital. So those are, the you know, can we bring technologies inside those physical things without changing their architecture and their design so that they can operate better, they can operate more efficiently, we can control them with, uh, uh, with more precision, we mm. can get more productivity out of machines. Mm. This is something we have almost entirely failed to do. Yeah. Correct? So th that combination of hardware and software and bringing them together and embedding intelligence, forgive me for being a little bit broad, no, no. but I think that's a huge opportunity. Yeah. Uh, and that combines maybe, you know, and, and that's feasible 
because computing is now ubiqu ubiquitous, connectivity is ubiquitous. Uh, you have uh, advanced algorithms uh, that can learn and they can be embedded because mm -hmm. they're small enough that they can run on the edge. So these are all opportunities that are not, let's say, as simple to pick out like yeah. a Klarna or God yeah, knows. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're not business model innovations. They require a combination of different engineering disciplines. In fact, I think some of the most innovative projects that we saw is, you know, because we've 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 been doing tech transfer uh, in Italy, and we've also have good relationships in in France with the with with the university ecosystem. So, the best projects I've seen are projects where they can combine different engineering disciplines: yeah. mechanical engineering, electrical yeah. engineering, etc. And that brings the know-how from all these different disciplines to come up with a solution that maybe solves. In each problem, which if you take it globally, could be a fairly sizable problem, yeah. correct? Or, and, or, and, or I mean, you could even. But you require that course. expertise. It's not easy to sort of copycat. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, uh, I, I see huge opportunities there as well. So yeah. it's it's going to be exciting. I, I was smiling throughout that because there's a couple of things. <laughs> so firstly, when you mentioned capital efficiency, the CFO in me was just like, ah, finally good. someone's so talking about capital efficiency. Absolutely. That's great. But no, but equally, like we're working with a couple of businesses that actually are doing very similar things. So one company called Edify, which um, has uh, built software that sits inside uh, um, uh, point of sales and, and um, uh, weighing machines in supermarkets. Correct. It's so embedded, essentially, correct, it's embedded yeah. but it's mm -hmm. working on the edge. So all of a sudden, yeah. they've been able to, 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 to just make you know, that process far more efficient than what the supermarkets have been doing you know, up until now. And you know, if you think about the sort of shrinkage and wastage in supermarkets, even shaving one, two, three percent of, of of that is it, it equates to a, a, an incredible saving. And equally, we spoke to I spoke to um, Renan uh, Devilliers from OSS Ventures. His, his podcast Correct. Uh, is is uh, one of the last that I did of last year. But uh, you know, the, the, it, it, he's much more of a venture studio. But essentially, they're building tech for or or, or they are funding and building tech within operations so within factory operations correct, right correct, so correct. essentially all those exactly as you said so they're, they're not very sexy no at all, you know, not at all. Like, yeah they are not very sexy but but they, they are they're necessary they're yeah. powerful yeah. they there's a market for them yeah um well, and and they and, they, and, it, and off, often there's not a lot of competition. No, and and because it, because <laughs> they're not sexy, it. and it, and, it, and, it, and essentially they're the th they're the things that power the world, right? Like the, the, yeah. they are the places where, yeah, I don't know, whatever the, the coffee capsule that you drink, or you know, uh, or, or the mug that you buy, or whatever. They, that's where they come from, and just right. building software that makes those processes uh, better and more efficient just adds uh, immense value. Now that it's been absolutely incredible speaking you, uh, to you today. My pleasure. Arish. Um, Thank you for having me. No, no, but absolutely uh, a joy to have had you here. For our audience, um, where's the best place for them to find you online? Are you on LinkedIn? I'm on, on LinkedIn. Twitter? They can reach out. Uh, I'm generally very open. And uh, yeah, you've got my contact details there as well. So Amazing. Yeah, well, and our website, 360cap.vc. So if anyone's interested in knowing more about us, that'd be great. For sure. We'll drop those into the show notes. Thank you so much for joining me All the best. Me today. Thank you, Irish. Thank you. Cheers.